joined now by survivor Polly Brooks and welcome and thank you for being here today. Oh, thanks. It's my pleasure. So let, let's begin. You were you were living in Hong Kong at the time. You were banking. You were enjoying a very successful life. You'd taken a, a trip away to Bali with some friends and it was here that you met Dan for the first time and he was there as part of a, a rugby trip and he'd been playing rugby and you said from the moment you saw him it was love at first sight. Oh, yeah, yeah, it really was. And, and life is such a, a, a crazy thing, isn't it? So, you know, I was in London. I was a young lady in the city and a little bit bored. I'd split up with a boyfriend. I was offered this chance to go to Hong Kong, um, arrived, uh, was living the, the dream, really, living an amazing time uh, and looking for something fun to do. So one of my friends uh, suggested we went to Bali to this rugby tour. Uh, and I was the only single one of four. Um, and there was all these wonderful expat boys there. But yes, I met Dan on the side of a rugby pitch and it was instantaneous yeah. yeah you said it was insane chemistry insane chemistry yeah and actually I watched the documentary last night and the wedding video the last time I watched that wedding video was about a year after it happened yeah. and just oh. watching the love was amazing well even yeah. even watching the, the the clips from the documentary that we just showed then I mean this this is still incredibly raw for you and tough to see I don't yeah I don't think you can um, experience the, the level of trauma pain and loss yeah. and it ever goes away I think you can rebuild you can still have a lovely time you can you can celebrate your successes you can move forward but the pain's there always right there. always there well um Bali you met there so this became an incredibly important place to, to the both of you and I think it was uh, almost a, a year to the day that you went back there and he proposed to you you came back to the UK to get married as we saw there and you just described a, the most perfect wedding day your best friend from the age of eight Annika was bridesmaid um and it was later on that you went back to Bali for this weekend, wasn't it? And you actually invited Annika to come along with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, with hindsight, obviously, we should never have gone. But, you know, we'd got married, as you say. It was a fantastic wedding. Um, we'd been to the Maldives and Sri Lanka on our honeymoon. And we'd gone back to our jobs. And Dan was a lawyer in Hong Kong. I was in banking. And really, we shouldn't have gone. It was a long weekend. But one of my clients was playing for one of the Singapore teams. And Dan was able to get a day off. So we went because, as you said, we'd been engaged there, we'd met there, it was our place. And you'd only really been in the Sari Club for about a minute. And... Yeah, 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 well, yeah, about a minute. Like, as I say, we, so we'd all, ten of us, gone out for dinner and we'd gone to, like, a local Indonesian restaurant. There was a guy called Peter Record and he, he actually spoke fluent Indonesia, uh, uh, Indonesian and, and we'd had this lovely meal and, at the end, the ladies went to pad their noses and the boys headed off to the club. So they had already arrived when we then arrived a few minutes later. And we'd eaten quite a lot of food and had a few drinks. And, um, you know, Dan turned to me and said, you know, babe, do you want a drink? And I was quite full. So I said to the girls, actually, I feel a bit full. Shall we go for a dance? So I said, and my last words to him were, no, babe, I'm all right. And then we headed off into the back of the dance floor area. Um, and, you know, we, we were dancing to share, I believe. And literally within seconds, the first explosion, uh, which obviously was a suicide bomber, which we later found out. But at the time, it was loud enough that everyone heard it and sort of went, oh, what's that? And someone said gas explosion. And then that's when that the flash. massive bang went off and the yellow light came towards me. And it always sounds really naff when I say that, but it's the only way to describe it is like yeah. being in a movie scene and being thrown up and the terror and it was, yeah. And it was that, it was terror. And yeah. you were one of the lucky ones. I mean, you were, I think you were trapped under a beam or your leg was under a beam. So the weirdest thing is when, when everything collapsed in on top of me, like it was black and silent just for like a split second, eerily silent. And then suddenly all the screaming started. Yeah. And then I realised I was on fire. And at that point, you're, you're, it's fight or flight, isn't it? It's like, oh my God, I've got to get out of here. Yeah. But before thinking, I'm going to die. I literally thought I was going to die. Well, it's a, guy, a guy called Noel, I think you. who... who yeah, so he helped me. Put, so put I, you out. Yeah, he did. So I, I pulled myself up and out onto the roof of the club um, and I was wearing Vietnamese-style trousers and they came off and so I sort of was aware that I was just wearing my knickers and the top, um, but I was able to run across out the side of the club and down the rubble and this chap, Noel, who actually we're still in touch with, uh, he, he sort of wrapped this blanket around me and held me upright because I just wanted to collapse. Well, you were... Uh, you've no idea... It's chaos. Uh, you've no idea where anybody is, if they're OK. Back then, not many mobile phones. I mean, you managed to borrow a mobile phone to phone home, which you saw a little bit of that in the documentary, and then you all rushed off to Australia uh, for specialist treatment. Um, Darwin, I think, first, and then Brisbane. That's right, yeah. Um, and it's there that you're 
told? Because you're thinking, well, are they OK? Is Dan all right? Is Annika all right? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I was trapped in a cul-de-sac for a couple of hours and, as you rightly say, someone handed me a mobile phone and I was able to ring my mum and, at that point, I had no idea how seriously injured I was and knew I was burned, but... Um, and I, I didn't want to worry them, so I was just worried about Dan, Annika and the others. And I was like, just ring their parents, find out if they've called home. Because I'd got out. I mean, obviously, I could see what happened, but um, there was hope for me that they'd got out. Yeah. And, you know, certainly the first few days afterwards, the, you know, they could well have survived. Um, but as time went on, I think probably I knew after day four or five that if you haven't heard from them by then, that probably wasn't going to be good news. And um, I think it was about 12 days by the time every single mm. one of my friends and Dan and Annika were all confirmed as not having made it. So I think it was that, that was the point when, um, you know, the realisation that I was the only survivor... Mm really kicked in. Well, you had survivor's guilt, didn't you? Oh. I did have survivor's guilt. I think well, I felt like I was really unlucky. I felt like they were lucky because, you know, they'd just gone. Like, you know, they didn't have to deal with the pain, the bereavement, the, the moving lives, because I lived in Hong Kong, so I was, had to go back to England. I had to deal with funerals. I had to deal with moving my life from Hong Kong to England. I had to get better. I had to cope. I had to be... I had to rebuild my life from it being completely fantastic to shattered into this disaster zone. And, and, and many times, it took me probably a year, 18 months before, I was actually glad that I'd survived. Wow. Wow. Gosh. And I mean, even... 43% of your body was burnt, I think. And it, yeah, it, it, it's, so, it's, yeah. This is screaming agony. Yeah, so, I mean, we, yeah, so 43% burns, which is bad. Um, but we, for us, unfortunately, as well, being in Bali, third world country, not straight to great treatment or water or anything like that. Um, you know, we all had MRSA bugs and really quite poorly. So I had no idea, really, that I was so close to life and death uh, until, luckily, I got through it. But my poor parents arrived and, and luckily I hadn't told them how bad I was. So the plane journey, they were mostly worried about Dan, mm. Annika, not so much about me. And then they turned up and I was swollen to twice the size and I was straight into intensive care. And my parents were told she might not make it. So they, they, that's what they were greeted with. So. Um, over the years, and as sort of part of a way of kind of making some sense of what happened, or at least dealing with it, or putting some good into the world after something so horrible, you started the charity in Dan's name, and this is Dan's Fund for Burns. I mean, congratulations, because over the years, £2.5 million, which is an awful lot of money for that charity, how has that helped you and, and others? So, so when the bombings happened, my perfect little world was obviously decimated and my innocence was taken so you know when someone does something quite evil towards you your belief in everything changes so you you believe that bad things can happen that they're bad people and what the love when I when I reached out to try and do something positive because everything was so black and so negative yeah. the love that I got and the support and people went off and raised loads of money for me and friends of Dan and all the others that died went off it little by little helped put me back mm. together and or when the, I have now very been lucky to have two children and when they were little, it was really hard to carry on the charity. I was often doing it at night and I was thinking, oh. Um, but when I help other burn survivors who are in that moment where their lives have just suddenly been mm -hmm. turned upside down and I get their thanks or I can see what it does and helps them, it makes me carry on. I, and, and my mum's the same. And I think, you know, the reality is, is that I survived. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. I live for them. I have to do... I, they don't have any choice. I have to raise money. I have to make something good but come from what so they try to do. You've got your MBE, I think, in 2020. Yeah. Um, and, uh, as Holly said, £2.5 million pounds ongoing. Um, and, and, as you said, when you came out, there wasn't that much care for, for people who, who'd suffer from um, burns. And so you concentrate... And one of the things you concentrate is that support... Absolutely. So when I, you know, when I was first burned, there was no, well, the internet was very much in its infancy. That'll tell you how old I am. Um, there was no uh, support groups in, in person or online. We run a weekly support group online for burn survivors. We have a peer-to-peer -peer befriender system. So someone like myself, who's perhaps down their journey, is able to, to help 
befriend so someone who's quite yeah. newly burned. Yeah. It's really scary to be burned. It, it, you know, it's not something you really think about or know about until it happens to you. And it's not very glamorous. So it's, not, it's not that easy to raise money for, because it often, you know, for the people it affects, it's so life-changing. Yeah. Yeah. And I was lucky that my face was largely it was burned, but not too badly. And I have shrapnel wounds and things and lots of old lines. But, you know, I think, you know, lucky that my face wasn't burned. But, you know, I still have to deal with my scars. I've had to learn to, to, to cope with them, to adjust, to, to accept my body for what it is and to be grateful that I have two arms and two legs. And it's, it's this journey. And, you know, there wasn't any support around. And, you know, we all know that mental health is really the most important thing. And, Sorry, the NHS doctors are amazing and they're brilliant at putting us back together in terms of like the actual yeah. surgery. Yeah. But then you're sort of tossed out into the real world and, and left to, to deal with life. Well, this, is why, this is why you are so important. This is why the fund is so important. Dan's Fund for Burns will put all the details uh, on all our socials. Oh, um, we, we think you're amazing um, and thank you. For thank you very today. much. Thank oh, you. Thanks so thank much for inviting me.